Welcome to Spring Creek Church Online. We're so glad that you're joining us today. As we get started, let's pray. God, we just thank you for this day that you have given us, Lord. I pray for every person watching that you may bless them, that you may use them, that this word may speak to them, Father, and that it may prompt them, Lord, to walk in action, Father, that they will seek you, Lord, in everything that they do as they move forward. So, Father, we thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of today's sermon is Boundaries That Bless, Living Free from Toxicity. We're, dis we're discussing setting healthy boundaries with toxic individuals. When we think or experience toxicity, what we are referring to is the quality of being harmful, poisonous, or destructive. In the context of relationships and interactions, toxicity describes behaviors, attitudes, or environments that negatively affect your mental, emotional, or physical well-being. We all know people who are in toxic relationships with toxic people. And dealing with these individuals can cause stress, harm for yourself and unhealthy dynamics within the relationship. And by the time you're done interacting with them, you feel emotionally drained, exhausted, anxious, frustrated, confused, out of control, and completely doubting yourself and your life's choices. Have you ever thought, what in the world just happened? I don't even know what's happening right now. I don't even know who I am anymore. And I'm starting to question all my life's choices. These people can be coworkers. They can be friends, acquaintances, and family members like your spouse, children, or parents. Some of these people are easier to deal with than others because there can be natural boundaries like space, time, and distance but others can be almost impossible to deal with because they could be right in your own home. And though today we're talking about how to set boundaries with toxic individuals in general, I would like to share my personal story with toxic individuals. For more than 30 years of my life, I've struggled with a lack of boundaries with my parents. But for the last 10 years, I have struggled to maintain the boundaries I've set for myself. For most of, of my mother's life, she has struggled with alcoholism. But for most of my childhood, it was kept a secret. I had no idea, but I did get the sense that something just wasn't right. But there were periods of time where she would abstain from alcohol, and there were even times when things seemed normal. I was raised in church, and my father was an elder. He was a preacher and a music director. My mother was a Bible teacher. In fact, it was my mother who helped me prepare my first message when I was around seven or eight years old, where I memorized Noah's Ark word for word from a children's Bible. When I was a teen, my mother gave in full blown to her alcohol addiction. Soon after, my father followed suit. This daughter of a preacher and a teacher was now a daughter of alcoholics. With that same intensity that they once dedicated to serving the Lord, they were now applying to their addiction. Growing up with alcoholics, I felt anxiety fear, and uncertainty due to their unpredictable behavior. I just hated going home from school. And when the school bus passed by my house and I saw their car in the driveway, I could feel a sense of dread come over me and walked as slow as possible to prolong what could potentially be a war zone when I got there. I felt extremely isolated and exhausted trying to keep their secret. I quickly learned how to become a people pleaser and perfectionist because I was afraid of triggering my parents' fits of rage and anger that often led to verbal and physical altercations. I was hypervigilant and constantly on the alert and sensitive to changes in our home because you just never know where the landmines were. I learned to suppress my emotions as a coping mechanism to deal with the chaos at home and learn to deflect expressing or communicating difficult emotions by making jokes because really, who doesn't like to laugh? I developed trust issues from all the broken promises, inconsistent and manipulative behavior. And unfortunately, all this did not end when I firmly began to follow Jesus. It didn't end when I moved out or even when I got married. It didn't end when I had children or even when I graduated with a degree, even when I started my career or even when I became a pastor. I wish I could tell you that it, it all ended the day I left home, but I didn't have the knowledge, tools, wisdom, or discernment to know that I had to learn to set and maintain healthy boundaries. I was in survival mode, just trying to gain balance and control of a relationship that was unbalanced and totally out of control. 
For most of my adult life, my mother has been trying to control and manipulate me to use me as a resource to fund her lifestyle as an alcoholic. I remember her constantly asking specific questions about, you know, our income, how much we made, about all our finances, so that she could determine if I had enough to give them. And then I remember feeling guilty if I purchased an expensive purse or if my husband tried to buy me a new car or, or something nice for our home. Even as an adult, I was afraid of her physically hitting me and would flinch if she came too close to me or she came too fast. But I continued to allow guilt trips and sad stories to control my behavior, and I foolishly exposed my children to it, thinking that she wouldn't do anything like that to them. Now, one day, we were in my parents' house, and my mother was playing with my daughter, who was probably about four years old at that time. My, my daughter was in front of the sofa playing with her, and, and I was at the dining room table, and I couldn't see them on the floor. But all of a sudden, I saw my daughter pop up from in front of the sofa, and I saw the horrified look on her face. She was trying to scream, but no sound came out. Her tears were rolling down her face, but her voice couldn't catch up with her pain. I ran to her, and I grabbed her, trying to find out what happened. My daughter was pointing at my mother, and my mother said, I just pinched her a little. She's just exaggerating. When my daughter's words finally caught up with her tears. She said, Grandma punched me in the stomach. I wish I could explain to you the anger and rage that came over me at that moment. I wanted to hurt my mother the way that she hurt my daughter. But my husband grabbed me and my kids and literally dragged us outside before the chaos broke out. Now, I wish I could blame my mother for what happened to my daughter. But it was my fault for not setting boundaries when I knew that she was dangerous. It was my fault for uh, exposing them to some of the same things I had experienced as a child. And I wish I could tell you that immediately after that moment that I was able to set boundaries, but I didn't. I just didn't know how. But my eyes were open and God began to show me all the anger, rage, resentment, and bitterness that was in my heart. But not only was I affected by all the traumatic events my husband and kids had to deal with all my unhealed trauma as well as their involuntary exposure to our toxic family. And as a result of not setting boundaries, I experienced significant emotional, mental, physical, and relational consequences that I'm still addressing till this day through therapy, spiritual direction, and through the healing power of the Holy Spirit. It was only 10 years ago that I began the process of setting boundaries. Not perfectly, but not always consistently, not even the right boundaries at times, but each failed attempt to maintain a boundary taught me more about myself and the reality of the people and the situation I was dealing with. So each failure was not a failure at, at all, but a learning opportunity that God allowed me to have to teach me that boundaries were key to getting the freedom I was looking for. Today, I'm still setting boundaries more drastic than ever before. So what do you do when you are in a relationship with a toxic person or people? Or better yet, what do you do when the toxic person is your spouse, your child, your parent or friend? How do you navigate these challenging dynamics and find the balance between love for yourself and self-preservation? You want to be a good Christian. You want to do the right thing but you feel so conflicted. And the conflict between what it means to love others like Christ and loving and protecting ourselves. Because doesn't the Bible say, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another? Then Jesus tells us to love your neighbor as yourself. Then Paul tells us to be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. And then the one that I have struggled with literally my whole life, honor your father and mother. But how can I do that? How can I honor people who don't respect me, who mistreat me, make me feel bad about myself, and ultimately don't love me or are just incapable of loving me the way that I deserve to be loved? How can this relationship make me feel so bad, but I'm supposed to honor them? How can God use me if I can't honor my mother and father. As a believer, someone who loves the Lord and wants to bring honor to him, when I think about setting boundaries, 
I found myself asking uh, lots of questions like, am I just being selfish? Am I overreacting? Is it as bad as I think it is? Am I a hypocrite? If I set these boundaries, will they still love and, and respect me? What if they get angry at me? And how do I tell them what my boundaries are? And, and, and then how do I enforce them? Is this going to change the relationship forever? And why do I feel so sad, guilty, and afraid all at the same time? And while we're thinking about setting these boundaries, we're suffering the consequences of not having any boundaries at all. We suffer from mental and physical exha exhaustion, stress, anxiety, resentment, low self-esteem, depression, and engaging in unhealthy relationships. We can become codependent where we engage in relationships where our self-worth is tied to another's approval or needs. We can lose our identity, constantly prioritizing others' needs over our own. And without boundaries, we may struggle to separate work from personal life, leading to imbalance and dissatisfaction. Failing to set boundaries can distract us from our spiritual disciplines and relationship with God. Without clear boundaries, we may find ourselves compromising our values and beliefs just to please others. Constantly sacrificing our needs and desires can lead to a lack of fulfillment and purpose in life. Without boundaries, we may struggle to focus on and achieve the goals that we set for ourselves, whether in our personal lives or professionally. Toxic people and their behaviors distract us from reflecting the character of Christ in every single aspect of our lives. It hinders our ability to be the best coworker, the best friend, daughter, aunt, sister, brother, father, and mother. It distracts us from living out our God-given purpose by blessing others through our everyday lives. In the Old Testament, Nehemiah knew exactly what it was like to encounter toxic people who tried to distract you from God's purpose. After the Babylonian exile during the Persian Empire's rule over Judah, Nehemiah, who is a Jewish cupbearer to the Persian king, learned about the destruction of the walls around Jerusalem. After learning about the condition of Jerusalem, in distress he fasts, he prays, and he seeks God's favor to help his people. Nehemiah requests permission from the king of Persia to go to Jerusalem and rebuild its walls. The king granted his request and provided letters of safe passage, support, and resources to complete the task of rebuilding the walls. When Nehemiah gets to Jerusalem, he inspects the walls at night and comes up with a plan for reconstruction. He organized the people, assigning different specific sections of the wall to different families and groups. This assignment was placed in his heart by God to help in the reconstruction of Jerusalem's walls, but also to ignite the spiritual renewal of the Jewish community. Like times in our life when we are trying to live our best lives for Jesus, trying to live out our purpose in everyday matters that impact our friends, families, and coworkers, would there be a testimony with no test? Absolutely not. There were three people who were determined to distract Nehemiah from accomplishing the mission that would impact the lives of the whole Jewish nation. The first was Sanballat, who was a governor of Samaria and held significant political power. His intention in opposing Nehemiah was driven by his desire to maintain control over the region and prevent Jerusalem from gaining strength and challenging his authority. The second was Tobiah, the Ammonite official, whose people were the historical enemies of the Israelites. Tobiah's intention in stopping the rebuilding of the wall was personal because of this feud, but also political. The third was Geshem, the Arab leader, who was also threatened by a restored Jerusalem, fearing they would diminish the Arab influence in the region. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem began to mock and threaten the Jews when they heard of the news that they were rebuilding the wall. Now, how many of you know that toxic people will mock you when you're trying to stay focused on your God-given assignment? The opposers did everything in their power to discourage and intimidate Nehemiah. Imagine the pressure he felt knowing that these men had the influence and resources to destroy his efforts. The ridicule wasn't just casual insults. It was a calculated effort to break his spirit 
and stop the work that God had called him to do. The tension, it was noticeable, and the fear was 100% real. Nehemiah responds to the ridicule and insults by praying. Then he set up armed guards at the wall who took turns with people to build the wall. They worked with tools in one hand and weapons in the other hand, ready to defend themselves from their enemies. Nehemiah faced continued opposition from Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, who attempted to lure him into a trap. Sanballat sends an open letter accusing Nehemiah of planning a rebellion against the king. Nehemiah denies these accusations and prays for strength. Then his enemies tried to trick Nehemiah into seeking refuge in a temple, which would have been completely unlawful and discrediting. Nehemiah discerns that this is a plot and refuses to enter the temple. Even with all the challenges and threats, the wall was completed in just 52 days, causing Nehemiah's enemies to lose confidence. Nehemiah's response to this toxic opposition is a powerful lesson for us. Despite the threats and ridicule, he remained steadfast. He didn't engage in arguments or allow himself to be distracted. Instead, he turned to God in prayer, organized defenses, and encouraged his people to keep their focus on the mission. He said, the God in heaven will give us a success, according to Nehemiah 2.20. His confidence wasn't in his abilities, but it was in God's promise and strength to overcome. How can we, like Nehemiah, stand firm against toxic opposition and fulfill the calling God has placed on our lives? Nehemiah had four strategies for addressing toxic people. The first strategy is found in Proverbs 4.23. It says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. The first strategy we can learn from Nehemiah is to guard your heart with vigilance. The people who worked to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem did it with tools in one hand and weapons in the other, ready to defend and guard themselves. This is what we must do for our hearts. We continue to bless others while picking up our weapons, while protecting ourselves from the attacks of toxic people. Proverbs 4.23 emphasizes the importance of guarding your heart because it is the source of all life's actions and behaviors. The heart acts as the command center for everything we do, think, and say. When toxic people come to distract you from being a blessing to the kingdom and in the kingdom of God, guard your heart because your heart will determine where you go. Jesus supports this in Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 and 35, teaching that evil actions stem from the heart. He says, a tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You broad of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. You see, outward behavior is merely a reflection of the internal state of the heart. Meaning, if the toxicity can enter your heart, you too will become a toxic person. Setting boundaries is about being vigilant in guarding our hearts so that we can be to the world who Jesus is to us. The second strategy we can learn from Nehemiah is the ability to discern toxic behaviors and influences in our lives. As believers, we are called to navigate relationships with wisdom and grace. God, in his infinite wisdom, has provided us with the gift of discernment through the Holy Spirit, enabling us to recognize and respond to toxic behaviors and influences in our lives. The Holy Spirit provides us with inner guidance and wisdom, helping us to see beyond what people look like and rec recognize the true nature of people and situations. John 16, 13 says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. 
He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. The Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, helping us discern right from wrong and in identifying toxic situations and environments. The gift of discernment acts as a protective measure, shielding us from harmful relationships and influences. Discernment brings clarity to our uh, interactions and decisions, ensuring we align with God's will. We will be able to discern the signs of a toxic person, like manipulation, where someone is trying to control or influence you in a clever, sneaky, or dishonest way, or lack of accountability, where people don't take responsibility for their own actions and most of the time they're too busy blaming other people or emotional instability where their emotions can be unpredictable and extreme. Maybe they demonstrate controlling behavior and try to dominate or control your actions and decisions. And maybe they just disrespect personal boundaries. The Holy Spirit helps us recognize these qualities by prompting us to feel uneasy or cautious around certain individuals. Y'all know that feeling. Something just ain't right about them. This inner warning system, or red flags as we like to call them, guides us to make wise decisions regarding our relationships. The third strategy we can learn from Nehemiah is continually pray for wisdom and guidance. By seeking God's help, We can navigate difficult relationships with grace and strength. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Nehemiah prayed throughout this whole process because he would not have been able to lead himself and the nation of Israel through this toxic situation in his own strength. This brings us to the fourth strategy we can learn from Nehemiah. It's to maintain and protect your peace. When he was being attacked and plotted against, he kept his peace because he knew that God was in control. A toxic person will often attack your peace first. They harass you. They talk about you. They accuse you. They they, they wanna get you just as unhappy as they are. They want you to react in a way that is totally out of character for you so that they can accuse you of being the toxic one. While we are all called to love others, discernment helps us maintain peace by identifying when to step back from harmful relationships. Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I want to read you part of a text message I sent to a toxic person who continuously tried to bait me into a fight. Here's what I wrote. I'm learning to protect my peace. Unfortunately, interactions with you can be very unpeaceful. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of the drama. I'm tired of you making decisions that negatively affect the rest of us. I'm tired of trying to create a comfortable life for you. You don't want to be happy. You don't want to be kind. You like to fight and hurt people with your words and actions. This is not criticism. It's a lifetime of experiences and observations. There is nothing I can do to make you happy. I can't force you to be happy. Can't force you to be grateful or even appreciative. Being in my life is a privilege because I am a good person, but you treat me with contempt, entitlement, and disgust. So I have a choice. Either I learn to accept it or I choose not to be around it and keep my peace. So I'm choosing to keep my peace. I'm not angry. You are forgiven, but I can't allow you to keep inflicting pain and hurt in my life. If you want to change, then you have to choose to change. So every time you feel tempted to text me trying to engage me in an argument or guilt me, just read this message again and again so you can remember why I've chosen to keep my peace. I pray that one day you can experience true peace over your life, peace that only Jesus offers. You see, protecting your peace often requires setting boundaries guided by discernment. 
The Jewish people worked on building the wall with tools in one hand and weapons in the other. The weapons we have are practical strategies to set boundaries with the toxic people in our lives. In his book, Boundaries by Henry Cloud, he provides several principles to set boundaries. He says that we have to identify our limits by understanding what behaviors are unacceptable, by clearly defining our personal limits. We also have to communicate clearly by using direct, calm language to express your boundaries. Be specific about what you will and will not tolerate. He also says that we have to use I statements by communicating your boundaries and acknowledging your feelings and needs to minimize the other person from feeling defensive. I'll give you an example. You know, I feel hurt and disappointed when I find out that I've been lied to. Another principle is stay firm and consistent by maintaining your boundaries consistently. Don't give up or give in to pressure. Another one is limit exposure by reducing how much time you spend with the toxic individuals when possible by creating physical or emotional distance. Also, seek support by surrounding yourself with supportive friends, family, and mental health professionals who respect your boundaries and encourage you to keep them. Also, we can practice self-care by engaging in activities that cultivate your physical, emotional, and spiritual health. We can be prepared for pushback and understand that toxic people may resist or test your boundaries. Stay firm in maintaining and protecting your peace. Then we have to know when to walk away. If someone continuously violates your boundaries, despite all your efforts, it may be necessary to limit or even end the relationship. And lastly, rely on spiritual guidance by seeking wisdom and strength through prayer and other spiritual disciplines, asking for guidance in setting and maintaining healthy boundaries. Nidra Glover Tawab, the author of the book, Set Boundaries, Find Peace, A Guide to Reclaiming Yourself, she wrote, healthy boundaries are not walls. They are gates and fences that allow you to enjoy the beauty of your own garden. We need to be beware of building walls instead of fences. In relationships, walls and fences symbolize different approaches to boundaries. Building walls are a defense mechanism that creates barriers to completely block out others. Nothing gets past walls. And the problem with that is that though it protects us from the bad, it keeps the good out as well. Building walls leads to isolation and disconnection from all the potentially healthy relationships and community that God has placed in our path. Now fences, on the other hand, symbolize boundaries that allow us to interact with people while still encouraging healthy connections and protecting our well-being all at the same time. Building fences gives us a balance of discernment, compassion, and self-care that are necessary for cultivating meaningful and healthy interactions and relationships. So our goal should always be to build fences, not walls. I want to end with this confession. When my father died, I was estranged from my parents for over a year. His own inability to set boundaries and his codependency, codependency contributed to all the choices that led me to take drastic measures and walk away from the relationship. It was those choices that he made that contributed to his death. The night that I got the call that he was in the hospital, I thought to myself, what happened now? What did he do? But it was worse than I had imagined. When I arrived to the emergency room, he was already brain dead. They had him on a respirator and the doctor recommended removing it because there was nothing that they could do. My mother who was intoxicated at the hospital refused to remove it. They moved him to the ICU. My husband took my mother home so that uh, she could collect herself. I stayed in the ICU watching my father slowly lose his life through the night. I couldn't say a word. I was shocked 
and I was in disbelief that his alcohol addiction led him to this point. I was fighting the temptation to feel guilty about not speaking to him for a year, while at the same time, I was also fighting the temptation to apologize for setting the boundaries I needed to protect my heart and maintain my peace. I know I wasn't overreacting. I know I wasn't being selfish. And I know that I'm not a hypocrite because I loved him with all my heart, but I needed to do it from afar. And every day, I fight the temptation to feel guilty and question my decision. But I know that decision helped me focus on fulfilling the calling of my life that could never have happened with a heart that was unprotected and exposed to toxicity. That heart would have led me away from the Lord where the boundaries led me to him. So today, I pray the Holy Spirit has given you discernment to recognize toxic people and situations. Remember, God will give you strength to guard your heart. Pray for them and for yourselves. Set boundaries and protect and maintain your peace. By relying on the gift of discernment, you can live according to God's will. In all things, seeking God's wisdom and guidance will lead you to a life of peace, fulfillment, and spiritual growth, just as it did me. If there are any of you who have built walls, Today, I pray that you would tear them down and build fences. Let's pray. God, I pray for all those who are watching right now. I pray for all those, Father, who, are, who have built boundaries, Father, and are finding difficulty, Lord, in maintaining them. I pray that you may remove the guilt, Father. I pray that you may remove the sadness, Father, but that you would give them strength right now. I pray for all those who are in toxic relationships, Father God, that you would help them, Lord Jesus. Give them discernment to know that they are in a toxic relationship, Father God, and give them strength, Lord, to set boundaries, Father God. Let them recognize what they need, Lord, in order to protect their hearts. Father, and lastly, I pray for all those who have built walls, Father, keeping out everyone and everything, Lord Jesus, even the blessings that you are trying to give them and pour into their lives. I pray, Father, that you would help them, Lord, tear those walls down, Father, and help them build fences where they can monitor, Lord Jesus, and engage in relationships, and if they need to, Father, that they would be able to walk away, Father, but that they would not reject any of the good things that you are trying to pour into their lives. Father, I pray for all those who are hurting right now, Lord Jesus, that you would heal the broken places of their hearts, for all those who have experienced trauma in their lives, Father, that you would bring healing, Lord, that you would surround them with people who would encourage them, give them strength, Father, and encourage them to get the help that they need, Lord. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, and we thank you for your healing. Father, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. To get updates on our uh, online campus, all you have to do is text the word online to 96995. We will see you next week.